In Chinese mythology, there are four classic novels, all among the world's oldest and longest works of fiction. Over the years, they've been adapted into different translations, comics, movies, and wartime strategy video games. Some are used as the source material for Sega Saturn titles. Romance of the Three Kingdoms is the great tale of feudal lords fighting over a crumbling Han dynasty. The 120 chapter saga takes us from the year 169 to 280. Throughout its more than 500 years of existence, it became what is likely the most read historical novel in all of China. Eventually, video games were born. And not too long after, the Japanese development company Koei formed in 1978. In its first few years, Koei's focus was computer sales and business software. But in 1983, they committed business world sin. They tried making something fun. Nobunaga no Yabo released for computers in Japan, a wartime strategy game based on the island nation's feudal period. Have you ever played Risk? Neither have I. Nobunaga became pretty popular. The series got 17 installments, each acting as an improved version of its predecessor. Western players got this by the second installment, called Nobunaga's Ambition. It's graced several dozen consoles and computer systems, including the Genesis, along with the Japanese exclusive for the Saturn. The series boasts 10 million copies sold worldwide by 2018. One of the games in this series is a Pokemon crossover. I'm not kidding. During Nobunaga's digital reign, Koei worked on a very similar series based on, you guessed it, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Its first game came out for Japanese players in 1985. Just like its brother across the East China Sea, Three Kingdoms saw several revisions across dozens of machines. With each new installment came tweaks, better graphics, and new features. It quickly became successful in the West. Dungeons & Dragons creator Dave Arneson spoke highly of Three Kingdoms, saying it will quote, keep players at their keyboards for many a night. The year is 1995. Some 10 million people regularly use the internet. What's attracted many of them is the World Wide Web. It hit, and within like two years, it just, it's become so powerful. Romance of the Three Kingdoms 4, Wall of Fire, is set to come out for the North American Saturn in early October. By October 7th, it slapped shelves, according to store owners on Usenet. GamePro says it retailed at a nice, nice. $69.95. Three Kingdoms 4 has already been out for the Super Nintendo. Now, Saturn adopters can add their new console to the long list of Three Kingdoms platforms the first next-gen system in America to play this ancient Chinese war game classic. Will Sega bring Romance of the Three Kingdoms right into the next generation? Hey yo, it's time to play some ROT3K! The player is greeted by inviting intro music put to this FMV of an ancient army riding a boat. It's commonly believed these clips came from the 1994 Romance of the Three Kingdoms TV show. Even though the game has no credits, I did find this clip from the last cutscene that matches up with part of the TV show's intro, so there you go. Of all the games I've ever played, this might have the steepest learning curve. Figuring out how to play takes a heaping dose of learning as you go and research. The goal is simple, take over China. There are 43 cities and you must conquer all of them. Sounds simple, right? Tell that to the dozens of menu options and stats to scroll through. Look at all these things. Pressing Y gives you a description of what each option does, but the game does very little to actually instruct you on what you're supposed to do and how to move forward. It's so complex, 
fact writers can't get a grasp of how each officer and ruler will interact with each other. There's just too many variables to keep track of. Each turn represents a month. You're allowed to do many, many things during your turn, which ends only when you want it to. There are certain investments and time-sensitive tasks which require turns to end in order to progress, so you can't just conquer China in one month. As a first-timer going into this somewhat blind, the pacing seemed to be pretty slow. I think a good way to illustrate its confusion for newbies would be to walk you through my first experience. I immediately saw you could create and name your own officers, so I just went through and did so. Took some inspiration from Western Recreation. My first attempt seemed to start out strong. Why yes, I will recruit you. While my city was seemingly burning down, I decided the problem was I didn't make enough officers, so I quit and started over. In my second attempt, I selected multiple rulers. I tried drafting more men and investing in my cities. Without realizing it at first, drafting lowers the sput rating. Since I don't care about sports, I didn't care about this meter. At some point, I won my very first battle. I had no idea how, but I was like, yeah, I'll take it. And then I realized by selecting multiple officers, I actually started a six player multiplayer game against myself. Kind of cool that you can play this long game with several friends, like a board game, just more deep and complex and more electronic. But I didn't want to play against five myself, so I quit and started over. In my third attempt, I realized that to invest in cities, I need to assign officers to each investment in order for them to actually do anything productive. I want a battle against Chao Mao, fucking ending his family line by executing this enemy of the empire. Ah! I also made the mistake of allowing the game to force me to watch computer battles, which sucks. It took about 30 minutes to get through watching the computers fight. Then my people revolted again. I didn't know how to solve the problem, so I quit and started over. This time with guides I found on the internet. If you want to go old school, the included 58 page instruction booklet tells you about what everything does. By the way, 58 pages is more than double the length of a usual Saturn instruction manual. This doesn't do much to tell you how to apply these things in game. I found it helpful to watch some YouTubers play it, like JG Egger and Solid Nate. This helped me understand how to properly advance the game without screwing myself over. <music> Trying to use some of this advice in my fourth attempt, I still got hung up quite a bit. I asked some kind strangers online. They told me it's normal to have to play this game multiple times before understanding it. As websites targeted toward middle-aged housewives say, Confucius says, it doesn't matter how slowly you go, as long as you do not stop. There are six scenarios, each taking place in different parts of the romance timeline. Earlier scenarios have more rulers, each with fewer cities. Later scenarios have fewer rulers, but they command more cities. Not all rulers start with the same amount of cities. It's based on history, after all. You get to pick which ruler to play as. In most cases, a ruler starting with more cities makes for an easier game. When in doubt, Chow Chow's family line is pretty much a safe way to go. Turns out, sport actually means support, a rating for popular support. When you draft for troops, support lowers. To raise it, you must have an officer with high charm give provisions to the people. Drafting troops also lowers your training rating, making the soldiers less powerful in battle. You can assign officers to train them over a certain amount of months. The more officers, the more effective the training, but this also keeps those officers from performing other tasks until the training is complete. The guides I read indicate six months is an adequate training period. Each city has four investment categories, farm, economy, dams, and tech. Their ratings are here. You want them to be close to or above 100. To get them there, you have to invest with gold and assign an officer. Over the span of a few months, the money is used up and the rating increases. For farm and economy, the higher they are, the more gold and provisions you get once a year. Tax time is in January, harvest is in the fall. A higher dam rating will make your farms less susceptible to spring floods. 
higher tech improves your ability to create weapons for war. In each city, you have a certain number of officers who can do those things like give provisions to the people, lead an army into battle, recruit more officers, form alliances, spy on other cities, commit arson, I could go on. You saw that giant list of things they can do. Each officer can only do one thing per turn, or month as they call turns. However, you can assign an officer to a specific investment and still make them do the aforementioned shit. During the competing rulers' turns, they can attack your cities, spread nasty rumors about you to lower support, burn your crops, all sorts of stuff, pretty much the same stuff you can do. Perhaps the most dangerous ruler is Mother Nature herself. Natural disasters can break out in between turns, and they all come with fun little FMVs. Things like floods and plagues. Plagues, by far, have the best FMV. He's in constant pain. Miss Nature can also bring you good fortune. Like favorable weather for bountiful harvests, you can also get randomly invaded by tribes. This does not initiate a battle sequence, but it will lower your soldier count. This is why it's good to have at least a few dozen soldiers in each city. War is the way you typically spread your domain and take over cities from other kingdoms. Conquering China. You can move officers, supplies, and soldiers into empty cities to take them over. Make sure you're not depleting resources in other cities while doing so. You can also threaten other rulers into bending the knee. That'll take over a city without having to attack it. Your team can form alliances with other rulers. This lets you ask them for help with battles. Once you feel like your tidal wave of rippling men are ready to crash into the shores of enemies, it's time to fight. You typically get the opportunity to send an officer in as a spy. That depends on their skill set. That'll tell you about how big their army is or what kind of equipment they're using. Before entering the fight, you must assign squads led by commanding officers from your city. You can only attack cities next to the one that you're starting from. Certain officers can have specific battle skills. The more officers in a given squad, the stronger it is. In a battle, each side gets 30 turns per turn. Okay, so like, you know how the, like, greater turns, like from the map, the, the months? So like, in battle, you get 30 battle turns per bigger turn slash per month. If you use all 30 turns before the battle ends, it has to resume next month. This is called an extended war. If there are 10 extended wars going on at the same time, you will not be able to save your game. Side note, one save file takes up nearly all the internal memory, so a memory cart is highly recommended. The city being attacked can either defend from the field or from the castle. If the castle is lost, the defending army loses. The winning army will have a chance to capture some enemy officers before the battle ends. Then you can try to recruit them. Not all will want to change sides, so you can free them, jail them, or f***ing end them. In a battle turn, you can move, attack the enemy if you're within range, and make a plot. Plots consist of things like setting a trap or setting fires. Charging depletes more soldiers in one turn, but this can lead your army to being thrown off or set back. It's a risky move. If you have multiple armies surrounding an enemy force, you can group attack them for more damage. You could also choose to have your officers duel and watch them fight to the death. If you think you're going to lose, you can flee to preserve soldier count, but this opens up a window to your enemy. They can capture your officers. The music indicates your odds of winning. If you're on the losing end, this desperate, scary track will let you know. There's also a song for when the odds are neutral, and a happy track if you're about to curb stomp. The overworld map music acts the same way. Starting out, there's this nice battle song that plays out. and the more cities you control, the more pleasant sounding the music becomes. 
Throughout the game, your officers might find items that will increase your power in battle. Other items will raise loyalty and various political abilities. On my fifth attempt at playing this video game, something strange and unexpected happened. I began having fun. I picked Scenario 6 with ruler Chao Rui. He's in the blue. This is sort of like playing on easy mode, except having this many cities does mean I have to balance more things. I feel at this point, I know enough to take advantage of this rolling start. Pandemonium will conquer China. Warning! Do not take this video as a game guide. There are many ways to play and beat three kingdoms. I guess what I did is apparently one of them. In my first turn, I started investments in every city. I made sure to keep them going throughout the rest of the game. In cities with lots of officers and the ones bordering enemies, I ran a draft. I made sure this was done in a way that I could quickly regain popular support by giving provisions. <laughs> Beiping gained independence and became an enemy of my kingdom. I trained my soldiers for six months while ensuring my economy and farming were in the green everywhere. Red guys started to attack me, winning and losing some of their fights. But over the span of a couple of years, my guys were good enough to start expanding south. Slowly, Chao Rui's kingdom washed over southern China. I easily gained control of the northern green and red cities, eventually dominating the landlocked southeast. I had a lot of well-trained soldiers in the capital, so I started moving them north to reclaim Beiping, while making sure my southern armies stayed strong. Beiping would not go down without a fight, so I made sure I had at least 500 well-trained soldiers. They were tough, but eventually, I brutally kicked their teeth in. And f***ing ended Gong Sun Yuan's family line. Meanwhile, I finally took over the fierce soldiers of Chengdu, capital of the pandas. Pandemonium. The Green Kingdom allied with Red and occasionally helped each other defend their cities from my terrifying beefcakes. All the while, I'm moving my northern soldiers south, but a fierce plague breaks out in northern China killing some of them off on the way down. But once my forces joined, we dominated the southern end with relative ease, f***ing ending the family line of my enemies. That was that. After dozens of hours and multiple restarts, I finally conquered China. I probably didn't do it the right way, since this is my first successful playthrough, but I still did it, fair and square. There are many aspects of this game that I did not fully understand and didn't fully utilize. For example, you can see I developed no battering rams or catapults. I played through the scenario without using any items and without realizing I could give gold to officers to make them more loyal. Writing as ruler? Poor. Doesn't matter, still won. There are many avenues left to explore and I can tell you, this won't be my last time playing Three Kingdoms. Romance of the Three Kingdoms 4 is not compatible with the Saturn mouse. While playing, I noticed the Saturn's disk drive had to spin a lot. Nearly every single menu selection sparked a loading time, some longer than others. It happened so much. After many hours, those loading times got slightly longer and longer, with disk spin sounding crunchier and filled with more struggle. This makes me wonder if Three Kingdoms caused permanent damage to my disk drive. While I can't confirm this because I'm not a technician, I did at one point endure a soft lock, forcing the game to restart itself, losing my progress from when I last saved. You also might have noticed the graphics. When Saturn is pulling off amazing sprites in a stall in Rayman, you'd expect a strategy game to look a little better than a Super Nintendo game. It kind of looks worse. Sure, it has fun little FMVs, but the maps and battlefields lack color and depth. Even the menus look kinda sloppy compared to the sharp presentation of the Super Nintendo port. Calling back to my previous review of Minnesota Fats. Fred, watch it, don't break the door! How does this prove Three Kingdoms is better on a next-gen platform? FMVs are not enough. 
I would argue the presentation of the Super Nintendo port looks more visually appealing. It has what's called in the Super Nintendo world, Mode 7 graphics. This looks way more slick and detailed than Saturn's map. Poor graphics, combined with the ridiculous loading times, show me Koei did not properly optimize Three Kingdoms for the Saturn's hardware. And it's supposed to be a 2D powerhouse. Come on, Koei. The core gameplay is still excellent and addicting. I had fun. But the slow pacing caused by loading times and a lack of optimization just totally kills gameplay. Severely slowing down the fun right when stuff gets exciting. What a disappointing waste of potential. Real Time Associates, a totally unrelated developer, made a game engine called Rat Beast. David Warhol told us about this in a Shiro podcast interview. Anything they made with this engine could be directly ported to the Saturn and PS1 right out of the gate. Didn't have to tweak it. Games like Iron Man Exo Manowar were made on Rat Beast. As I mentioned before, Koei seemed to put Romance on as many platforms as possible. It has dozens of ports. So I tried comparing gameplay footage to see if they might have done something like Rat Beast with this Saturn port. It looks a little different than the PS1 version, which came out roughly half a year after the Saturn release. Doesn't look a whole lot better, still looks kinda bad. But the menus and music are not the same. This does, however, look a lot like the Panasonic 3DO port exclusive to Japan. Menus and music are the same. They both came out at around the same time, within a month of each other. If this was designed to be put on both consoles, or the Saturn's port was sloppily pasted from the 3DO, it would explain why this doesn't appear to be properly optimized for Saturn hardware. Perhaps my greatest annoyance with gameplay flow is scrolling through cities you have to press the Z button to highlight the next city. You can't scroll backwards. It's terrible when you start commanding more than a dozen cities. I think I might have spent like a quarter of my time playing Scenario 6, scrolling through cities, just trying to get to a specific city. Why isn't there a mouse? Why can't you just open up a map and select which city you want? Then, while writing this script, I discovered via the long ass instruction manual that there's a map feature at the very end of the menu. It lets you select whatever city you want, with the cursor. I played the entire game not knowing about this. Fun, Fun fact! When Dark Legend comes out, North America will have 24 Saturn games, three of which based on ancient China. That's roughly 12% of the entire U.S. library at this point. Unless you count Virtua Fighter or Astal's art style, just one game is based on Japanese culture on this Japan-created machine. Fun, Fun fact. fact! The Sega 32X port is the console's only Japanese exclusive. Fun, Fun fact. fact! Despite its name, Romance of the Three Kingdoms has no sex scenes. Even when it was relatively new, the series wasn't nearly as played as more popular franchises, so not a lot of magazine writers took a look at this Saturn port. Next Generation said it's not for action-only gamers, but a solid strategy game, rating it 3 out of 5. Fusion Magazine had some interesting things to say. I'll read them to you. Romance by the Chinese Menu Koei has long mystified game players with its incredibly boring, endlessly complex Chinese historical games. 408 characters with names that sound like cow pie and hung low, there are apparently gamers out there who actually find this type of game entertaining. 2 out of 5. Game Pro liked it, rating it close to 4 out of 5. Bro Buzz agreed it's too similar to the 16-bit port, saying, If you conquered this version of ancient China on the Super Nintendo, think twice about a return trip. He did not note the vast difference in how the map looks between the Super Nintendo and Saturn. I've seen many people in the comment sections of videos and other posts talk about how much they loved this Saturn game. Many said they sunk hours into conquering China. I don't blame them. This is a good game. Sadly, I don't know if the Saturn is the best way to play it. In Chairman Segata's conquest to dominate the 5th gen, 
He came out of the gates fighting hard for Saturn when deciding which officers to use against the great rulers of Sony, Panasonic, Atari, and Nintendo, he decided to leave Three Kingdoms somewhere in the northwestern corner by himself, whose purpose is just to make sure the people get provisions. I cannot stress this enough. Three Kingdoms 4 is an awesome game, but this is not a good port. Unless you're just wowed by FMVs, the Super Nintendo version looks better, on Saturn, loading times are constant, and it somehow looks worse. It's not unplayable, but it's not the best. Now, if you really want to play the Saturn version, I highly recommend using an ODE or console emulator, since this game is hell on the disk drive. As someone who doesn't play a ton of strategy games, I grew to really enjoy Romance of the Three Kingdoms. There's an exquisite core game here. All in all, it's just another entry into this insanely widespread franchise. It would be fair to say it's niche, but to call it unsuccessful would disrespect this outstanding video game. Since 1985, the series has sold 8 million copies overall, worldwide, as of 2020. The 14 installments collectively have more than 60 ports to other machines. It also spawned the critically acclaimed spin-off series, Dynasty Warriors. So what kind of conqueror will you be? Will you put recruitment and charm before war? Or will you ruthlessly take over the lands by force? Or will you lead a confusing legacy because you spent half the game trying to figure it out? Like me. Perhaps the confusing arc is meant to emulate Emperor Qin Shi Huang post-Mercury pills. I got it! The Three Kingdoms games did get Chinese versions. The Communist Party is still known for banning an obscene amount of games with its infamous Great Firewall. In 2019, they went as far as banning games based on imperial Chinese periods, depending on whether they depict the nation in a positive light. I found out Three Kingdoms is not a part of that. You can still buy Romance of the Three Kingdoms 14 with the online Chinese store Taobao, so I guess it made the cut. Was the Saturn version of Three Kingdoms 4 available in China? That's a tough question to answer. In 1995, consoles were not banned yet. According to Satakore, one of the Saturn's release regions is Asia, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Depending on your political views, this does not explicitly include mainland China. Looking at its small list of releases, multiple versions of Three Kingdoms made it, including four. So assuming this Saturn region was accessible in the mainland, yeah, China proper got it. The region also got Myst, House of the Dead, and an RPG based on Chinese mythology. It's good to know this game was seemingly playable in the country it's based on. I hope you guys are happy I downloaded Taobao for the sake of video game research. Ever since, I've been getting more and more scam tech. Remember kids, Chinese history is filled with nothing but happy and fun memories. We did nothing wrong, and if you deny that, we'll find you with facial recognition. Yay!